Let's take our seats, and if you'd like to, in your Bibles, open them to Jeremiah chapter 6. And uh, I thought, it, thought in this afternoon session, we'll look at the Westminster Standards and give an introduction to them. The Westminster Confession of Faith, and then the larger catechism and the shorter catechism. But I must say, uh, and I mean this, that really, when I was a boy growing up, I would sometimes visit some family members. I was brought up in Sheffield, England. And sometimes I would leave my auntie's house. Her name was Auntie Nellie. And I'd leave, and my dad would say, what are you doing? Come back here. I said, well, I don't want to come back. I'm going to the car. He said, come back here. And he would force me to learn a habit that I've never ceased to practice. And I would have to say to Auntie Nellie and other relatives, thank you for having me. That's a good practice, isn't it? And I want to say thanks for having me, John. I'm genuinely going to go back with a good report to my wife, and family and friends, I feel I would, I would have missed out on a blessing if I'd not said yes to come. And um, I've just really enjoyed my conversations with, y- with y'all. You think you know that phrase, y'all? <laughs> with different people, I really have. Who was the lady from, from Sheffield originally? There we go. So um, it's been really nice meeting different people. So I thought before we begin reading Jeremiah 6, I would just say for two or three minutes or four minutes, how I became a Christian. Um, I was brought up in a mining village called uh, Kiverton Park uh, on the southeastern side of Sheffield. Uh, Both my granddads were both coal miners. On one side, he decided he was going to set up a haulage business and left the coal mine and actually made it and made a good living. Um, I was baptized as an infant in 1965. And really, that's really where my pilgrimage began. I was connected to the church from the very beginning. My parents were not born again at that point, but they were committed as far as they knew to the church. Interestingly, and this is, you know, the power is not in baptism, it's not in water, it's not in the minister, it's in, you know, it's efficacious for the elect. But I was actually, I could take you to the font where I was baptized, and there was a meeting house in this before the Church of England building was there, that went back to about 960 AD, built by the Leeds family, of which Leeds is named after. And it just reminds me about the lineage of Christianity that goes way back in this country. And really from being a young boy, I would be convicted of sin. I remember being in the playground. There were no really committed Christians that I ever really remember meeting. But one boy blasphemed the name of Jesus. And I remember being about seven thinking, what a terrible thing. But um, I went the ways of the world, I mean, I, but I decided to, I was going to go to university. None of my family had gone to university before. My dad was a, a, an engineer and well qualified, but he didn't go to necessarily university then. And I went to, we call it Birmingham, the Americans call it Birmingham, um, but Birmingham, England. And it was in my, my, some, uh, my grandma, one of my grandmas, used to get me to give thanks to the Lord at the end of my bed on my knees when I was a little boy. And she really, she was God-fearing but not a Christian, but put me in contact with the living God, really. I faced a crisis in my second year at university. I didn't know what to do, so I got on my knees in my uh, university bedroom. And I, I suppose, really, I cried out to the living God on my knees. What I can say is I got up off my knees believing in Jesus Christ and have never ceased to believe in Jesus ever since. But I wouldn't say um, that I really followed Christ immediately from that point. But the one thing I thought I want to do is to read the Bible. And there was no, no Amazon. I mean I, had, I mean, I was in darkness. Where, where do you get a Bible from? And two days after I'd prayed, a Bible came through the post from some born-again Christians who were friends of my parents who sent, the birthday present came late, it was my 21st birthday, a few weeks before, it came late, but it came two days after I prayed. I thought, wow, God, God is, 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 is around somewhere. So I began to read the Bible and was very embarrassed. I came home to, in the Easter holidays, and I went to see my grandma, and I said to my grandma, uh, I now believe in Jesus Christ. And I explained what had happened. She broke down in tears and said, I think you're going to be a preacher. I thought, a preacher? And I remembered the Church of England churches I'd grown up with. 
And without being disrespectful, but most of the preachers were not the kind of men I aspired to be. They wouldn't really clearly explain things. They'd walk around the village with long robes, and I thought, how could I explain that to my friends? And so I, I thought, this is, I didn't say to my grandma, but I thought, this is not a good idea. Sadly, I went to see the Anglican minister where I was brought up. My grandma's not a Christian. She breaks down in tears and says, I think you're going to be a preacher. Sadly, I'm a Calvinist, but this doesn't excuse that man who claimed to be serving the Lord. I explained to him what had happened. He said to me, Kevin, what you've experienced is a load of nonsense. Can you imagine that? But by God's grace, I stand here and uh, I, I went off my own path. I worked for Coca-Cola and, and uh, had a good career with them, but really became a workaholic. And really, it was while working for them, I thought there must be more to life than just this, getting a new car and more money. And, and I ended up in London, living next door to a Dutch lady who was married to a non-Christian, had been for years, and was a born-again Christian. She began to evangelize me. And in the end, my parents, in the meantime, they become Christians. I'm living in London, and they, my parents came down, and they, the lady next door invited me to church. So... I said, well, I'll think about it. And I prayed that night, a very arrogant prayer. Not that you would have ever done things like that. But I prayed and said, Lord, I'll go to church in the morning if I wake up. Which I never did early on Sunday morning. But I said to the Lord, I'm glad that God's merciful, but I'm not setting my alarm clock. Nine o'clock, boom, I'm awake. And I wouldn't normally have been awake because the only time I ever had off was Sunday mornings. So I went to church. There was about 400 people there. And I can remember to this day what the man preached. And it was an overview on the book of Acts. And I remember being gripped hearing about this man called Herod who was eaten with worms and died. I thought, how can you eat by worms? And in the sermon, he mentioned Coca-Cola. I've only ever heard Coca-Cola mentioned one of the times since. I've mentioned it more times now. And again, I thought, God knows I'm in this building. Which was a quite an unusual phenomenon, thinking, wow. So I, I then... The Lord had got my attention. I, I, my background was trained to be a scientist, so I needed to be, I suppose I'm a bit stubborn. I needed to be convinced myself. And within a number of weeks, reading the Bible, all the questions I had were answered. So I thought, well, the, 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 what you have to do then is to surrender your whole life to Christ. So I arranged a meeting with a pastor. It was on September the 6th, 1990. On a Thursday night after work, and once I went to see the pastor, I couldn't tell him why I'd come. I froze up, so I said to him, he said, well, why have you come? After half an hour, I said, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. He said, hallelujah. I thought, well, is, is this a cult or something? This is a bit strange. <laughs> anyway, he interestingly got me to do what I'd... He interestingly said, well, look, I want you to get on your knees and ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. So here I am. I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, well, use your own words. And I knew I was a sinner from the Bible and with my own wretched acts. So I got my knees on his office and prayed quietly to the Lord and got up and the pastor said, what do you feel? I said, I feel that my sins are forgiven. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say this. I don't think, I could be wrong, heaven may show differently when I get to heaven, but I don't think I blasphemed but working for an organization like Coca-Cola, it was a very macho environment. I swore a lot. Uh, I'm ashamed to say. But I got up on my knees and asked the Lord to forgive me. We spoke a little bit with the pastor. And I came to leave and something came out of my mouth as I left, which I was embarrassed about, as I came to say goodbye. You know what I said to him? God bless you. And I'd never used that phrase, to my knowledge, ever before. It was like, where did that come from? And by God's grace, I've never had to, there's some things, a lot of things I've had to work on a lot. But from that day to this, I have never sworn since. Never had to try and stop swearing. And I just experienced that when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. And in that area, I was just set free. But the following year was one of the worst years of my life. I mean, I thought everyone's going to be really excited to become a Christian. And this wasn't that encouraging. It wasn't a compliment when I had colleagues and I said, they said to me, you are the last person I ever expected to become a Christian. But I'm, I thank God for the blood of Jesus. 
And someone said to me, as a young Christian, they said to me, Kevin, this is just a passing phase. It won't last more than three years. Anybody ever had things like that said to you? And I thought, you know what? Most of my hobbies haven't lasted more than three years. <laughs> so I had this dreaded three-year kind of date down the track, thinking at that three-year point, it'll all fall apart. And what I can say by the grace of God, that three-year period finished a long, long time ago. And when the Lord bring, begins a work, he brings it through to completion. So I know that I'm only stood here before you by the grace of God. And um, as a young Christian, I have to say, I got converted in a church that was committed to preaching. So from being very young as a Christian, I just had an insatiable thirst for the Bible. But I sometimes wonder, and it's the providence of God, it, coming to my doctrinal convictions, I feel at times it's been like hacking through a jungle. Um, but at the same time, when you come to that, when you've paid a price for what you believe, you hold on to that treasure perhaps more dearly. And um, it's just the providence of God as it so happens. I left Sheffield when I was 19 and said um, to myself, I'm never coming back again. That doesn't mean the Lord always sends you back to where you're from. I happen to be ministering now in Sheffield, <clears throat> Sheffield Presbyterian Church. It's a church, well, it's no longer a church plant. But, um, and I'm happy to be there for the rest of my life. My wife and I, she's Dutch, we met in Albania. Somebody asked me, I have two daughters, Melody and Rivka. And, and they do know the Lord, and I want just to emphasize again, we've done what we can as parents, but it's God that's convinced them of the truth. And to him alone be the glory that they are committed to the Lord. And uh, we thank God for that. And so our motto is we keep plodding on, preaching Christ and, uh, and I can honestly say I'm 53, I can say I'm more excited about Jesus now than when I was a young man I'm as excited about the Bible now as, as ever and I could quite happily leave here and just sit in a corner and just read the Bible for three hours on my own, I just, I just cannot get enough of the word of God so it's been a delight to spend this brief time together I'm very thankful for the privilege to have come down. I need to leave after this session and then get back to Sheffield and I have to finish my preparation for tomorrow. I'm almost done. And we'll just value prayer for freshness. We're expecting a number of non-Christians throughout the day tomorrow in the church from the outreach we've done. And I don't want to be lacking freshness when talking to people, which could be important to them. Not that I'm the only person. but So, so thanks for... for Invited me, John. I'm very thankful to the Lord. Let me read Jeremiah chapter 6 as we begin verse 16. It says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Notice that. It's, Jeremiah preaches about the ancient paths. There's something about a sinful nature that will always want to wander off the ancient paths. Now, we're not talking about the church being old-fashioned, but we're not talking about modernizing everything in the church <coughs> and introducing worldly entertainment, entertainment methods to draw people into the church. You see, when I worked for Coca-Cola, I mean, I used to speak in conferences, I, I was involved in marketing, and we have to give it to them, they are successful at marketing. So I know marketing when I see it. So when I came into the church, I'd been in the world, and one thing shocked me was after a few weeks, uh, I, I, I turned my back on the world and come to Christ, and somebody came up to me and whispered in my ear, Kevin, we're going to a nightclub on Friday. Do you want to come? I thought, is this a practical joke? I've been in enough nightclubs in my life to know that the answer to eternal life is not found dancing around women's handbags. That might have changed now, but I, I said, are you joking? And they weren't. So they wanted to be Christians, but have this kind of, this, this worldly attractiveness. And so I know that introducing the world into the church and marketing methods is not the way forward. And when we read the Bible, we don't find Jesus resorting to methods. We don't find Paul the Apostle saying, listen, Timothy, we want you to get dressed up and do a quick drama and then I'll jump up and give a quick testimony. Paul went preaching Christ and him crucified, and the message of a crucified Christ was anathema. 
It was, you want me to believe in Jesus of Nazareth, which is a nothing city, and believe that that's where the Messiah has come from, who died as a criminal on a Roman crucifixion place of punishment, and you're saying, he's the Son of God? Come on, no kidding. Unless the Holy Spirit was going to persuade people, people would never come to Christ with such a stumbling block, and therefore, we're not trying to make it difficult for people to become Christians, but we need to make sure, how do I say it? We don't try and polish up the old rugged cross and what it means to be a Christian. Because in my few decades of walking with Christ, most of my time has not been easy. And, uh, but we used to sing a song when I was a young Christian. Don't, but I'm not, not sure about it theologically, but I like it. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. And there's many people who I set off on pilgrimage with when I was a young Christian. They're nowhere to be seen today. Nowhere to be seen. So have you decided to follow Jesus? No turning back. In fact, Jesus says that in Luke's Gospel, doesn't he? He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit to serve in the kingdom of God. And boy, there are temptations to look back. There be many temptations for me, the difficulty of preaching and in a country where people are not that interested in the gospel and thinking, well, you know what, I could, I could earn a lot more money for Coca-Cola. Why couldn't I work for a company like that and then just preach at the weekends in my spare time? <laughs> well, we all have different temptations, don't we? But I can say there's nothing better than serving Jesus Christ. And I'm not just giving you words. You can ask my wife. We, we, I believe that. So, the ancient paths is not about being old-fashioned, but it's the simplicity and the reverence that the Word of God requires for the church. And we've, I've probably had the privilege to be in, I don't know, maybe over 30 countries serving the Lord in lots of different places. And including Britain, I have to say, looking back, a sense of the fear of God has not always been a priority in different sections of the church. And Presbyterians can't claim they're, they're immune to that either. But don't we desire a sense of the fear of God? God is to be feared. He's awesome. He's infinite. So let's take a look then at the Westminster Standards I mentioned earlier on. And uh, there are a few copies left. There's the green book there, which is the Westminster Standards for today with essays. That one's £12. And this one is 6 and this is the Westminster Confession and the two catechisms there, nicely formatted, so anybody could enjoy reading them. Now, the Westminster Standards, as I said already, I believe, is one of the finest summaries of the Christian faith penned by the church in her long history. That's quite a statement. That's 2,000 years of history. It was drawn up by the Westminster Assembly. And you'll remember from this morning what, when they met. It was 1643. And they actually met until 1653. And uh, the Westminster Standards, we mainly consider to be, though there were other documents, the Westminster Confession of Faith with 33 chapters. And, um, and then the larger catechism with, you can remember how many questions? 196. And anyone remember how many are in the shorter catechism? How many questions? Well done, 107. Uh, so I'm catechizing you, you see. <laughs> and, you, know, you know the rabbi, you know, it's, gee, you know, I'm preaching in Mark's Gospel. Do you, do you know how many questions that Jesus asks in Mark's Gospel? 60. And it's the shortest Gospel. So clearly the use of questions in preaching and also in teaching is very, very important. And uh, there was a rabbi and uh, he used to teach all the time, always using questions, always using questions. And, and one of the students plucked up courage one day to ask him, uh, a question and, and he put his hand up and, and said uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Cohen or whatever his name was why do you ask so many questions when you teach us the rabbi paused he looked at the young student and said why not ok he answered with a question So, and Jesus does that sometimes he actually answers questions with questions and so the use of questions why is it helpful it gets us thinking it gets us uh, thinking through the truth. So 
The church, through a long history, have used questions to teach the church. Um, to many Christians, uh, the Westminster Standards will only be of historical interest. Um, but that shouldn't be the case. And we ask, as somebody asked the question this morning, why is the Westminster Confession and the Catechisms are, are of little a uh, little known and used by the greater part of the church today? That's a good question. Why is that? Well, I think there are many possible answers, but I think, I think a neglect of church history is one of them, and the consequent ignorance of how and why these confessions were, arose in the first place. But I think there's also generally, as I'm sure you'll agree, there's a contemporary lack of interest in doctrine in many parts of the church. Um, Especially where people seem to think that doctrine will hinder unity. Jesus Christ preached doctrine, which is the content of the faith. And he is the theologian par excellence. Uh, but I think we also have a, a culture today, which I'm sure you'd agree, that's increasingly opposed to the idea of objective truth. That there could be definite truth. And, uh, and some people feel, well, these statements of truth are too provocative. Could be other reasons. So our, our, our aim in terms of letting people know about the Westminster Standards uh, is to help people to understand the structure and the content of the faith. We, had a, we have a catechism class at 10 where we normally go through the larger catechism. Sometimes we've gone through the shorter catechism and sometimes the Heidelberg catechism, but mainly the larger catechism. She was brought up, she came from Japan to do a master's degree in Sheffield. And she quietly would come to the catechism class every week at 10 a.m. before the morning worship service. And, and uh, she was, her father was a Presbyterian minister in Japan. And she says during that year in Sheffield, either she was converted during the catechism class or she gained an assurance of faith in Christ. I said, why is that? She said, as I listened to the catechism class taught through the Westminster Larger Catechism for the first time in my life, I saw where the different puzzle pieces of the Bible fitted together. Isn't that amazing? Early 20s, and that was her testament. That, that got my attention uh, as, as a pastor. She was brought up in a Christian home, and yet uh, this got my attention. So, um, the, the Westminster Standards really have had a significant impact around the world, not least in the United States. And it was really mainly through the Scottish church that where, the, where the standards have gone. Now they go all around the world, in South Korea, and in, in Brazil, one of the largest reformed denominations in the world today, it is not in the Netherlands or, or in America, it's actually in Brazil. Um, there's, I, think it's with, I think two million members in one of them that use the Westminster Confession as their, symbol, as their, as their statement for truth. Um, now, if we look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I've already mentioned to us, it actually contains 33 chapters. And you think, 33 chapters? That's a lot. Well, doesn't it tell us in some respects how the knowledge of truth in the church is not what it once was, including in the 17th century? Now, I'm not trying to glamorize the 17th century. I have no interest of, of looking back with romantic spectacles. But let's take a look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Someone said to me, they were preaching from Habakkuk, our brother down there, and this beautiful verse. But I want to read another verse for us. If you can turn to Habakkuk for the Americans, it's Habakkuk. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story while you're finding Habakkuk. I was preaching in the States a number of years ago on the wrath of God from Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Well, the Americans don't call it wrath, they call it wrath. And so all the way through, I'm preaching on the, the, the wrath of God. I, I refer to it now as the wrath of God. This woman said to a friend, while I'm preaching on the wrath of God, I have no idea what he's talking about. Isn't that interesting? So when I'm in the States, I always refer to the wrath of God. But Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, chapter 2, here's this beautiful verse. It's not the one, but it's, it's so good we can't pass over it. It says, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. How many times does that verse occur in the New Testament? Anyone know? Three times. Once in Romans, once in Galatians, 
and once in Hebrews. And there's a different emphasis, a different slant of that one verse teased out in different parts. In the book of Romans, Paul introduces it. It was the verse that led to Luther's conversion. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, that verse is used, that the just shall live by faith. And the emphasis in Romans is on the word just. It's on the one who is righteous. How do we become righteous? It's by faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, let me ask you, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Because the day of judgment is coming. And for some of you, it's coming sooner than others, perhaps. Not because of just your age. None of us know when our, when our last heartbeat will, will be. Would you agree? None of us know that. None of us know. And we will give an account of our lives. So do you put your faith in Jesus Christ? In Hebrew, sorry, in Galatians, now the just shall live by faith. The emphasis in there is on, actually on the word live. It's on the word live that if you're righteous, then you need to live righteously according to the truth and not go backwards. It's easy to go backwards into all kinds of things. Their temptation was to go backwards to Judaism. For some people, it's a temptation to go backwards into the world. But the fact is, we are to live by faith, live as a Christian, live, live as uh, a Christian who's, who's committed to Christ. And so the emphasis on the word live, but in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about not shrinking back. The just shall live by his faith. The emphasis is on faith. And we have this great passage in chapter 11 that by faith, and I'm glad it's not just men in there. I am. Are you? By faith, Sarah. By faith, Rahab. And by faith, Abraham, who went out not knowing where he was going. Have you had times as a Christian, you had to go out not where you're going? I have. And it's a scary experience. But I've, if there's one thing I've learned about the Lord over these years, do you know what it is? It's this. I can say it in three words. God is faithful. Would you agree? God is faithful. I don't always understand what's happening. And I found some people I thought I could trust. You can't trust them as far as you can throw them. That's the phrase I got from my dad. You can't. Anyway, I won't repeat it. But that's not true of the Lord. No, have any of his promises ever failed you? Not one. Don't you feel sometimes that the promise of God, they become so precious to you, it's as if you've got, it's got your name on it. Don't you find that? As if he's got your name on it. One of those is, for me, is Romans 8, 28. I know it's for the whole body of Christ, but I'm sure that's got my name on it. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. I feel as if that, that's got my name on it. Now, that's not true. It wasn't written for me. But it so helped me in difficulties. I love the book of Job. Do you like the book of Job? Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. And trust actually probably goes beyond faith. Faith is probably based on the promise of God. Trust is because you get to know someone's character. And God's character is blameless. I remember when one of our children, she almost died more than once. She's in intensive care. I had this phone call from my wife saying, you better come to the hospital fast, Kevin. I said, why? They said, they're not sure if one of our daughters, whether she'll live or die. I said, what? So as I'm going to the hospital, it just became clear to me that whether she does live or die is in the Lord's hands. But whatever happens is this, is that the Lord never makes mistakes. Do you believe that? And by God's grace, the Lord had mercy upon her, and then she was back in hospital two weeks' time, almost... Very seriously ill, and the Lord have mercy upon her. But if she had have died, the Lord would not have made a mistake. Because he doesn't make mistakes. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. But the reason why things like the Westminster Standards are important to us, because we live in a sinful world, and as we've already heard from John, we need to nourish our faith. We have a reasonable faith. And so the Westminster Confession has 33 chapters. And now we can break it down into six sections. And um, 
Sometimes Christians do say to me, Kevin, this is, this is heavy. I said, it's not heavy. It's got lots of proof text. You can follow it up. But if I was a coach for the Olympics team, and we've got the English Institute of Sport opposite the, our worship place in Sheffield, where Jessica Ennis trained and ended up winning a gold medal in the, uh, was it the 2012 London Olympics? Yeah. And um, if I was actually training her to win the Olympics, which I'm not, you know, and don't, one of the events is you have to go jump over the high jump, isn't it, over the high bar. You know, I could make it really easy for her and said, Jessica, listen, you've had a busy week, it's been stressful, I'm going to put it at three foot. Oh, well, that's great. You know, jump over, fantastic. Well, it might be fantastic, it might not stretch her, but she's never going to win a gold medal. You've got to put the bar where she's going to be stretched. And likewise, the Westminster Confession is not written for ministers. It's written for Christians and for the church. And compared to what a lot of Christians have had today, it seems as if, Mr. Kevin Coach, you're putting the bar at nine foot. I can never get over the bar at nine foot. You see, you can't right now because everyone's been putting it at three foot. But it, it causes us to stretch and to grow in our faith. So it's not written for theologians. This is written for Christians. And there are 33 chapters, and sometimes people say, well, the thing is with confessions is people will take them more important than the Bible. Well, is that true? Because the first section is chapter 1, which is of the Holy Scripture. So the first thing it teaches us is to have a wholehearted commitment to the Bible and to rightly understand the Bible. And it tells us there are 66 books in the Bible. And though the Apocrypha is good, it's not inspired writings. Therefore, cannot be a rule for faith and practice. It teaches us, this might stroke the further wrong way for some people, but it teaches us that God doesn't speak now in the way he used to speak through the prophets. And so we're not to be looking for extra biblical revelations. Um, that scripture is sufficient for life and godliness. All scripture is inspired of God. And so it commits us and binds us, the beginning chapter, to be committed to the Bible. I mentioned my sister, didn't I? She, she may listen to this. But I remember as a very young Christian, I was very busy working for Coca-Cola. I think it was still working for them at that point, And I had a little time to read the Bible. And after being a Christian for about five months, I'm in a church service in Southampton, and the sermon is on what? Parable of the Prodigal Son. Boom! Sister's elbow between my ribs. I said, what are you doing? She said, this sermon's for you. I said, no, it's not for me. So we had a little mini row during the sermon. <laughs> Forgive me, but I tell you something, it was the grace of God, because it got my attention to listen to the sermon. And, and I realized, though I was born again, though I was a Christian, I wasn't reading the Bible. I had not had that personal Bible breakthrough. You know what I mean by that? It's like when a child first begins to read and you can't stop them. They just have that reading breakthrough. You, you know what I mean? Those who are teachers or, or parents. And so I got home and I thought, if I want God to speak to me, I need to read the Bible. So I just spent the rest of the weekend in the bank holiday, I think it was, just reading Haggai, reading Zechariah, reading this book, reading that book, until all of a sudden, I just couldn't put it down. And then she starts complaining and said, I thought you'd come to see me. I said, I have, but I just can't stop reading the Bible. And I've never been able to stop reading the Bible since. So I'm way off my notes, but that doesn't matter. Have you ever read the whole Bible? If you haven't, I want to encourage you as a brother in the Lord to leave here with a commitment to read the whole Bible. How do you read the whole Bible? Well, there's different ways, and many ways I've failed. One was, when I was a young Christian, I thought I couldn't read the whole Bible until January the 1st, because I bought myself a brand new book from the bookshop and read in the Bible in a year. So I was excitedly waiting for January the 1st to come to start. Well, what a disappointment that was. The busyness of my job meant by January the 4th or 5th, I was so far behind I couldn't keep up. So I pick up the Bible, and I've not forgotten the verse we're going to get to in Habakkuk 2 in a moment. And I'm going, 
Uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was God, and the word was God. I'm reading the Bible like this and just racing through about five or six chapters to get it out of the way. And by about 10th of January or so, I thought, this is not working. I'm not taking anything in. So I gave up on that one. But what worked for me was to find the contents list at the front of the Bible and think, what book would I like to read? And I'll think, I've got a bit of time on holiday. I'm away for two weeks. I'm going to read the book of Jeremiah. And I wouldn't set any time scale. And then when I'd finished, I would tick off Jeremiah. And I didn't put any artificial time scales on. And over about a year, I'd read the whole Bible. And I've never been the same since. And I keep on reading the whole Bible over and over again. Not every year, just just keep doing it. And uh, so I encourage you to read the whole Bible. But why is things like the Westminster Standards very important? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. We've been hearing about revival. What does it say there? It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the covenant promises is that it'll be the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Some charismatics think a cloud will come down. No, there'll be no clouds. It's the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the glory of God who became flesh. And so we see here that the, that the knowledge of the truth is what will fill this earth. So chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession is based on Holy Scripture. The second section is really about God. And I mentioned this morning, we see the God-centeredness. It doesn't start with man. The next section is chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5 are all about God. Chapter 2 is God and the Holy Trinity. Chapter 3 of God's eternal decree. Chapter 4 of creation. Chapter 5 of providence. I mean, you're looking at a man who believes that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days. And I, and I was trained as a geologist originally. And I came to the conviction that evolution is totally false as a non-Christian. So you can imagine how troubling it is for me now. I'm not a fundamentalist fanatic, but I'm committed to the Bible. When I was invited to a university a couple of years ago, and there were four of us on the panel. One was a pastor from some charismatic church. One was a new Christian working with students. The other one was a lecturer um, working at the university. And the question came up, how can we believe in the Bible when we've all come from monkeys? How do you answer that question? Well, the... MC asked me to answer first. I said, well, we can believe in the Bible because we've not come from monkeys. We're made in the image of God. Then the other three professing Christians on the panel all totally disagreed with me and said, we we believe in in evolution and most Christians now do believe in evolution. And I'm sitting there thinking, what a confused message that is. I was lectured by one of the experts in the United Kingdom in evolutionary theory. And during those lectures, I came to the conclusion, this theory is false. Because all of a sudden, we have the primordial ocean, and something jumps out of that onto the beach. So I I put my hand up in the air and say, Professor so-and-so, can you just walk me through those steps again? How do you get from the primordial ocean to this thing on the beach? Have have, have you you ever seen Mr. Bean? He he answered. He couldn't answer. So I thought, I, I just, and I wasn't being clever or cocky or difficult. I just thought, that's strange. Following week, the thing on the beach suddenly, supernaturally, sprouts wings and starts flying. So I put my hand up in the air and say, Professor, this is at Birmingham University, can you just walk me through how we get from that now to feathers and so forth? Same thing again, just waffling on and answering. The next week, We've got reptiles with feet. And, and, and I said, and I was, you couldn't, they, because it cannot give answers. The, the manual for life is found in the Bible, the word of God. And I believe that. So we see how important chapters like creation are. So it begins with God. That's the second section. The third section now begins with how we can understand ourselves. It, it deals with the, in the third section from chapter 6 through to chapter 18. It's the biggest single section. And it deals with sin, salvation, and the fall. Sin, salvation, and the fall. And begins with the fall of man, chapter 6. God's covenant with man of Christ the mediator. Subjects like free will, effectual calling, which is the new birth. And then all the 
key important doctrines like justification, adoption, sanctification, saving faith, repentance unto life. Notice that repentance unto life comes quite late on. The Arminians say that it's repentance first and faith and then you become a Christian. A bit like when I was a boy and we'd go to the, the seaside resort in Mablethorpe, I think maybe Great Yarmouth. You know, you, you put the money into the slot machine and pull the lever and out comes the prize. But that's not the case. Repentance and faith are fruits of being born again. And um, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that is the gift of God. So even the faith we have is a gift from God. So there it explains for us sin, uh, the fall and salvation from chapter 6 through to chapter 18. Here's a beautiful chapter 18 of assurance of grace and salvation. How many people pastorally need to hear sermons on that subject? How many Christians struggle that they're, you know, that they're genuinely Christians, but the devil's assaulting them? You're not a Christian. Gets them to look at themselves rather than looking to Christ. So the, the fourth section is what? It's Christian living. And how does it begin? It begins with chapter 19 of the law of God. How many churches today say, oh, the Ten Commandments are finished. We are free in Jesus. Ever heard that message? Free to do what? To do what you want. We're free to serve Christ. Christ saves the lawbreakers and he makes them law keepers, though it's imperfect. So chapter 19 of the law of God, chapter 20 of liberty and of conscience, this is all about Christian living. 21 of religious worship and the Sabbath day. Lawful oaths and vows, civil magistrate and marriage and divorce. And then the fifth section deals with the church. We have chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. How many is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven chapters on the church. Could that balance of teaching change the church? I've been in seminars where church planters have stood up and said, the Bible doesn't tell us how the church should be organized and run. Therefore, we, we, we call the committee to brainstorm what we think we should do. Well, that's nothing more than unbelief. You imagine if I was the... Let me think... If I was the head of British Aerospace and say we have no manuals on how to make equipment, it would be chaos, wouldn't it? And to think the head of the church has not given us instructions. And then the last two are very important for us. The last section, which is to do with the state of men after death and last judgment. There are two chapters. The state of men and after death and also the last judgment. So you've got those sections there. Well, as we draw to a close and just think about these two catechisms and recovering the lost art and practice of catechizing, I think one of the blessings that we've discovered is family worship. Where did I learn family worship? It was in the Netherlands. When I was first married, we'd go to the Netherlands and visit our family, and after the evening meal, they would give thanks for their food. At the, most of the Dutch eat at 6 p.m., by the way. They eat at 6 p.m., and they give thanks for their food. And afterwards, they get the Bible out and then discuss it. I thought, why? I've never seen this before. I thought, well, I felt uncomfortable at first. And I found out it was something called family worship. And one of the ways we've grown in the Lord as a family is by myself as the head of our household leading us most days, not every day, but almost every day after our evening meal, we get the Bible out from the children being young and we've learned to sing together. We've learned to read the Bible together and to discuss it and to pray together. Where my children, our children, learned to pray was around our meal table. We might have been here, they're older now, and, uh, you know, and, uh, but would have come, up, come back and said, let's pray for the old meeting house. And they would pray for that. Or let's pray for this chap from America, whose name was Bob, I think. Let's pray for him. He's in Belgium. And, and then they would learn to pray. And don't we need a recovery of loving family worship? Now, we don't stop work, family worship when the children leave home. Um, you know, my wife and I, and it, it, it's become for us almost like our daily quiet time. And it's not that we don't have a daily quiet time. Sometimes we'll go through a book of the Bible. Right now we're going through Mark's Gospel. 
sometimes through the catechism, sometimes memorize them. Um, but the lost art and practice of categorizing, as well as the church passing on the content of the faith. And I'm going to finish here, but um, I want to read, as we come to a finish, the first question of the shorter catechism, uh, which is for me the best. Uh, when I found, discovered this, oh, I just fell in love with it. It's probably the best summary of, of the aim of Christianity, apart from Matthew 6.33, that I've ever come across. Here's the first question of the short Westminster Shorter Catechism. And the question is, many of you will know, but it will do us good to hear it again. What is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? We've not revised that. We can't change that. It's just classic, isn't it? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Do you enjoy being a Christian? That question gets us to enjoy being a Christian and to live our lives for the glory of God. And so the larger and shorter catechism are great to read, to be taught, to be shorter, to be memorized if need be. Uh, but most of all, to be enjoyed. Because it's teaching us about our God and all of his glory. Amen. Well, I'm going to stop there, John. And maybe we can have some questions as we close. Um, and, uh, and again, thanks for, for having me. Who would like to start us off? I think Bob's got a question. Is the answer no? There's a friend of mine, he, 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 uh, you know the Christian Institute? And uh, Colin Hart, you know Colin? No. Anyway, one of the chairmen is, is John Byrne. You know John? Maybe I shouldn't be telling this story. Was it recorded? I'll tell it anyway. And uh, they had a committee meeting. There was a few of them there. And, and John's just a very good kind of leader. And he said, well, any questions? Any questions? And uh, he looked at Colin, the director. He said, Colin, you, you've got a question. Uh, no, I, I haven't, Mr. Byrne. I don't have a question. Well, ask it anyway, Colin, he said. <laughs> anyway, anybody have any questions? I, I, if not, we can close in prayer. You mentioned about... Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Like <clears throat> yeah, is that beautiful? Obviously, Psalm, yeah, Psalm 92. But yeah. those that be planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. And the two pictures are the palm tree and the cedar of Lebanon. And they will still bear fruit to their old age, remaining fresh and flourishing. Yeah, it's beautiful. We just had that with my mother-in-law. It was the word of God and the way God spoke through her life. Uh -huh. And we had, some, the we had Psalm 91. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And he's standing at the back of the church and he said, They've got to speak up, is it? That's what he called mm -hmm. it the other day. He said, No, I won't be able to hear. And she learned that song, and she can still quote it. Yeah. Right until 95. That's great. Hallelujah. That's great. Any questions about the Westminster Confession or Catechisms, please? In terms of uh, how much place you give to the Catechism within your church life, Would yeah. you, is it something that you read together every so or do you? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. 
Um, and I think um, there's so much good stuff in there. That, again, this doesn't belong to Presbyterians. Um, I, I think there's several ways. I think perhaps one of the greatest ways is begin to teach people about family worship, first of all. To not only read the Bible, but perhaps to begin to go through as families or couples, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism would be a good thing to do. We actually have, we, when we were church planting, we thought, how on earth are we going to be able to pass on solid truth to people? I happen to do a PhD on the doctrine of the church and the Trinity. Not that means that all I'm doing is right or anything else like that. But I traveled around different places, including Northern Ireland, to find out what would be the right way. And one of the things we established from the beginning was to have a catechism class at 10 o'clock, which was mainly aimed at adults. Uh, and then the worship services, which you have at 11 and 5 now. So that's a different format. It's more like this now, where we teach with question and answer. And it's really helped to fast-track people's understanding about Scripture and truths. It also means they get more out of the sermon when you're preaching and in service. It's almost like the car engine's warmed. And when else in the week do I get a chance to do it? I could do it in a midweek meeting to categorize, you know, to teach through the maybe larger catechism. You could do it then. Uh, you could do different ways. Um, no one is going to be able to get everybody, in a sense, but ultimately, it, it comes from a passion for me that I wish people had passed all this content on to me earlier in my Christian life. In God's providence, they haven't. And, and I spend the, my remaining days now, you know, sometimes you'd have coal lorries that would turn up at my family's house and they would shovel the coal into the coal bunker. Remember that? Anybody have, remember coal bunkers? Yeah, a couple of people. And I feel my job as a minister is really shoveling as much coal into your bunker as possible. And uh, I don't want people to have contact with me and think, yeah, they, yeah, they told me anything. Because if, that, if that was the case, then I, we're almost going to become like Roman Catholics, aren't we? Where we as ministers have got all this knowledge and we're hiding it from people. I want them to know all this and then they can come up to me and say, you're not holding true to justification. It helps you to be accountable. So, so different ways, probably encouraging family worship. You could maybe do a series in the midweek, you know, say between September and Christmas. We're going to go through the Westminster Confession on the middle section of justification and adoption and try different ways. Just don't bore the church. We want people to be... Uh, hmm? no, no, well, Martin Lloyd-Jones says if we stick to the Bible, we'll always be relevant. But we want them, we don't want to, it's like people say, how long should you pray for publicly in the service as a minister? And my answer is not too short and not too long. And you've got to learn to read people. You know, if I'm, same with preaching, I'm not going to, I do preach for 30, 35 minutes, but, so find what works. So when you're doing the catechism, yeah. you do the, you just read through, get them to read through the question, the answer, and then you look at the scriptures. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you ever come to Sheffield, I'd love you to come and... I probably, some people have been asking me to write something on this because there's virtually nothing on this at all. I mean, I'm a working pastor, so I don't have huge amounts of time to write the whole time. Maybe I should. If you're ever in Sheffield, let us know and you can have lunch with us and come, come and see the catechism class. So it is more of a format like this where we, will, we may take three or four questions and we'll read the question and the answer out loud and then I'll explain it and ask if there are questions. And there are different questions at different points. And it teases out of people what they don't understand and to help them. But it's important that there are kind of two wings of the aeroplane. One is the catechism, the other one's the scripture, and we keep them in balance. So if we're just teaching them the Bible without giving them that structured explanation, but if we're only teaching the catechism without scripture, that's insufficient as well, I think. Does that help a little? Good, very good questions there. Very good. Is that your son? Son-in-law. That's near enough. Any other questions? Bob, please.
these different professions and standards of civility and uh-huh. In, in your context, how do you, what do you do beyond reminding people at the start of your lectures um, on the Westminster Confession and the Catechism class that all of this points us back to God, to the Scriptures? What are the guardrails? What, what are you doing so that, you know, I just bought a nice new book yep. and, and it's the modernized Westminster Standards so that that doesn't become a uh, Theoretical end of itself, or I'm really enamored with this, but it's not integrated, getting it back to the scriptures. Yeah. I mean, it can happen, but I've virtually never seen it happen that someone becomes so enamored with the confession of faith that they forget the scriptures and God. I'm sure it can happen very occasionally. Uh, I find if anybody gets excited about the Westminster Confession or Catechisms, it's a work of the Holy Spirit and nothing else which drives them to God and to the scriptures and you, you learn, let's say, about justification and you, you, feel, you, you feel with wow God is great um, so I've not that, that, that potential problem is so rare it's such a rare spiritual medical condition we don't need to be overly concerned about it if it happens we will, we'll, we'll deal with it but it's so rare, it's like talking about a rare disease rather than helping people to be healthy. Good question. Anything else? William Bridge, by the way, he was part of the, he was one of the architects with 120 divines for the Westminster Standards. Uh, so, not that we put our emphasis on him, most of the Westminster divines, we don't know their names. And that's a good thing because there's a consensus there's no real superstars there. It's, it's hammered out doctrinal, doctrinal statements. Please, go on. See, the, the church is for them to have their creeds. Yeah, yeah. And yep. um, the, the divines, when they were coming to the supremacy of the word of God back then, yeah. this is one of the reasons why was it that they were putting it in the questions? Well, again, very good question. Don't forget one of the main principles of the Reformation from the beginning was Scripture alone, yeah. faith alone, Christ alone, um, to the glory of God alone, um, and, and so forth. So the principle of Scripture was one of the main battlegrounds. Yeah. And so the argument is, is, is that the foundation uh, and everything, the envelope around the church has to be Scripture. Because the deeper question then is, is authority. Is it the church that's the final statement, or is it scripture? Yeah. Of course, that was the argument with the Roman Catholics, and the Protestants argued that we have not departed, the Roman Catholic Church have departed. We're coming back to the ancient paths. Yeah. But the reality today is we have a, an explosion of private interpretations today, mm -hmm. where people are neglecting a historic understanding of the scriptures. And so we, we do have a lot of chaos that actually the Roman Catholics and others warned that could happen. And it will happen if Christians have the idea it's me and my Bible. And we don't learn from church history. We, we, we get all of our members, we don't force them, but we, we have membership classes and we teach them the Apostles' Creed and where possible get them to memorize the Apostles' Creed. Virtually everyone does, it's not that difficult. But it's amazing how many people have come to us from professing Christian background, and they've never heard of the Apostles' Creed. Never mind other creedal statements. And um, so, yeah, one more question, maybe, and we'll close. Well, thanks for your interest. And um, do we sing another hymn, or do we close in prayer, John, or what do we do?